Good morning. Thanks to be here. Today, we will talk about how to empower data projects with Apache Zeppelin and Neo4j. Just let me introduce myself. I'm Andrea Santurbano. I'm from a small city in Italy called Pescara, in front of, uh, which is co-located in front of the Adriatic Sea. I currently work for Laros. I joined the company two weeks ago, so it's a quite new situation for me. But I'm, I'm very happy. I, of course, love uh, Neo4j. I have some contribution in the Contrib ecosystem, in particular uh, related to the Epoch uh, store procedures. And uh, I also contributed to Apache Zeppelin, where I created the connector uh, for Neo4j. So thanks to my contribution, now Zeppelin officially supports uh, Neo4j. And we see how together. Who is Larus? Larus uh, was founded in 2004 by Lorenzo Speranzoni and has uh, its headquarters in Venice, Italy. We uh, deliver services uh, worldwide and we are the first Italian solution partner since the 2013. We are the creator of uh, the Neo4j JDBC uh, driver, uh, the Apache Zeppelin interpreter, the ATL tool, and we developed the over 90 epoch procedure. So the history uh, of Larus uh, with Neo4j is, uh, let me say, a, a love story that started uh, in 2011 and uh, brings us uh, today to have a, a strong position into the Neo4j contrib ecosystem. But let's see the agenda. It's a, a very lightweight uh, agenda. We see what, it's, uh, what is Apache Zeppelin. How many of you already know what is Apache Zeppelin? <coughs> Great. Great, thank you. So we see the history of the contribution. Then we have uh, two demo, one uh, of the display system and one how to build a data pipeline with Zeppelin, Neo4j, and the Spark connector. And in the end, we talk about how CAPS, Cypher for Apache Spark, can be integrated with uh, Zeppelin. So what is uh, Apache Zeppelin? In order to uh, understand what is uh, Apache Zeppelin, we have to understand what what is a data science notebook? Data science uh, notebooks are experiencing a rising uh, popularity. Uh, there are statistics that uh, say that the number of the notebooks hosted, the Jupyter notebooks, which is a, a, a Zeppelin-like uh, notebook runner, the number, uh, the amount of Jupyter, Jupyter notebooks hosted on GitHub has climbed for uh, 200,000 in uh, uh, 2015, tomorrow two million uh, today. At the end of the slide, uh, there are the references. You can, uh, uh, there is a link where you can uh, check these uh, statistics. Uh, so, why they uh, have this rising popularity? Because uh, there is a growing consensus that the notebooks uh, are the best interface uh, to communicate the data science process uh, and share its conclusions. And in many organizations, they're replacing uh, PowerPoint presentation. But what differentiates a notebook interface from an ID? Why notebooks are well suited uh, for, data uh, for data projects? If you think to an ID, it's built to be data centric, uh, code, code centric, sorry. So uh, it's focused on code writing, uh, debugging, and profiling. It's built to uh, manage the uh, complex applications such as frameworks or web application and so on. It's integrated with a version control system such as uh, Git, SVN, etc., and with build tools such as Maven, Gradle. And uh, there is one ID for each work workflow. So for instance, if you are uh, a front-end developer, you can prefer Visual Studio Code. 
If you are a Python developer, you can use PyCharm. If you are a backend developer, a Java developer, Eclipse or IntelliJ and so on. On the flip side, we have the notebooks. They are uh, focused to be uh, data centric. So they are focused on interactivity, visualization, and real time collaboration between the users. They are built to manage scripts, so we have uh, more, uh, less uh, code complexity to manage. They are integrated with uh, data sources, and there is one interface from, uh, for a different workflow. What does it mean? Consider these uh, three common roles uh, in uh, any data-driven organization. So we have the data engineer that can build uh, an aggregation of uh, trillions of uh, streaming uh, events, for instance. These aggregation, uh, all of this by using uh, uh, Scala as programming language and uh, IntelliJ as uh, IDE. This aggregation might lead an analytic engineer to build uh, a report about the, uh, the global streaming quality by using SQL and Tableau. And this report might lead a data scientist to build a new streaming compression model by using R and R Studio. If the, there seems uh, uh, completely different uh, and there is no overlap, uh, there are, uh, in fact, three common tasks. Uh, tasks. They basically all they have run code, explore the data, and present the results. So why notebooks are important in any data-driven organization? This is because they address the previously uh, listed tasks because they have the ability to independently execute and display uh, the output of uh, modular blocks of code. Each block of code is uh, called a paragraph. The ability to interleave this code with um, natural language markup, uh, such as uh, uh, HTML or Markdown, for instance. And uh, in the end, uh, and the most important thing in, is they uh, enable real-time con collaboration between, between users because data process is always an iterative, pro uh, an iterative uh, process. So uh, data projects have always an iterative process. So for instance, the data scientist uh, can ask a refinement of the aggregation to the data engineer. So this is a loop uh, into this flow. So what is Apache Zeppelin? It's a web now notebook. It's a notebook runner with a Blackboard architecture. And it's the first notebook, notebook runner that officially supported uh, Apache Spark. It's composed by three pillars. The display system, the interpreter, and uh, the Helium modules. So let's see the first one. The Zeppeli system, uh, the display system, it basically renders the output on the front end. There is the table display system, which basically uh, displays a table, and uh, it came out with uh, other five uh, charts, such as uh, the bar chart, the pie chart, and so on. Then we have the text HTML display system which allow to inject uh, HTML into the tables. And in the end, uh, starting uh, the version uh, 0.8, which is uh, released in, uh, in the beginning of the June, if I remember correct correctly, we have the network display system, thanks to uh, my contribution, that allows Zeppelin to display networks. Then the second pillar is the interpreter. Zeppelin, uh, the interpreter is a plugin which enables Zeppelin uh, to use a, speci a specific uh, programming language, for, for instance, Scala, Python, uh, and so on, or data processing uh, backend, such as Spark, Pig, Frink, and others. So we have the Spark interpreter, which is the first one uh, which was uh, supported by uh, Zeppelin. We have the Neo4j interpreter since uh, the version 0.8 and other 24 third-party interpreters. 
Each interpreter must be activated by using uh, the percentage prefix. So for instance, as we will see in the demo, the Neo4j interpreter will be activating by the percentage Neo4j keyword. The third pillar is Zeppelin Helium. It's a plugin system that allow to easily extend Zeppelin. It's composed by three parts. The Helium visualization, which uh, basically uh, uh, adds a new chart type. The Helium spell, that adds a new interpreter, which uh, runs only on, on uh, the front end. And these two are basically a JavaScript uh, application. The third one is uh, a, little more, a little more complex because uh, the Helium application is uh, a package that uh, uh, runs an interpreter on the back end and uh, has a display system that uh, displays, uh, that renders the result on the front end. Each Helium node, uh, Helium module, can be published on uh, Helium Orion uh, registry, which, which is a marketplace uh, of, uh, Zeppelin Helium, uh, of Zeppelin Helium modules. So everyone can uh, download uh, directly from Zeppelin. Now we see the history of the contribution. The first PR was made the, the to the November 2 of 2016, so it's uh, quite old, and uh, uh, was a, a big contribution because uh, uh, one part uh, is uh, the network display system and uh, the second part is uh, the Neo4j interpreter. So in order to simplify the review process of the uh, Zeppelin team, we, decide, we decided uh, together to uh, split the PR in two parts. The first one, is the network display system, Zeppelin 2222. And the second part, uh, Zeppelin uh, 2761, is uh, the Neo4j interpreter. So let's see the first demo. OK. This is the uh, Zeppelin interface. The, this is the home page of uh, Zeppelin. Uh, you can organize the, your notebooks uh, into folders, for instance. Here on the top right, we have all the configurations. Uh, and uh, we can see, for instance, if we, we click to interpreter, we can search for Neo4j. And there is a list of the properties we can configure in order to allow Zeppelin to interact uh, with Neo4j. So let's go to the first uh, uh, to the first demo today. So uh, 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 sorry, I forgot uh, that all the code is on GitHub. You will find uh, the link uh, at the bottom of the slides. So uh, you can uh, download the all the demos. Uh, it's all dockerized, so you only need Docker in order to get up and running. Uh, and uh, if you have some trouble or you want some suggestion, please uh, open an issue on, uh, in the repository. So this is the first uh, demo about the network display system. When you run the notebook uh, in your environment, please make sure that you have previously executed this notebook. If you click, you will be moved uh, here, which uh, this notebook uh, serves to download all the required uh, external dependencies, such as the Neo4j Spark connector and CAPS, Cypher for Apache Spark that we use today. So as you can see, uh, and uh, as I said before, uh, uh, notebooks uh, allow to interweave uh, code with uh, natural language markup. For instance, if I double click into this paragraph, we will see the markdown code. And uh, in order to execute an unnotebook, we can simply click here on the play button. And Zeppelin rends renders the, uh, the markdown uh, code. So 
the network display system is built in order to uh, extend the table display system so we can leverage uh, all, the, um, all the charts provided by Zeppelin. And it's built in order to uh, leverage the labeled property graph. How many of you already know what is a labeled property graph? Oh, great, great. So a labeled property graph uh, is a, a property graph composed by, so is a graph, so it's composed by a set of vertices. Each vertex uh, must have uh, an unique identifier, a label that uh, uh, identifies uh, the, uh, the type of the node, so if it's a person, if it's a project, and so on. And uh, each node can have uh, a set of collection, uh, a collection of properties, defined as uh, key value bindings. In the same way, we have a set of edges. Each edge must have an unique identifier, a source and a target node, a type that identifies the, the type of uh, the relationship, and a collection of uh, properties as key value bindings. So if we see the Network uh, visualization system is built in order to leverage a labeled property graph. And, and it's basically a JSON composed by these five fields. The first one is uh, nodes, which is mandatory. And it's a list of nodes of the graph. Each node must have an ID, and is mandatory, and an, the unique identifier of the node then uh, must, uh, can, can have uh, a label, the main label of the node, a list of labels, the secondary uh, labels of the node, and uh, all the collection of properties uh, must be attached to the data field. In the same way, the edges must have an ID file, which is a field which is mandatory, a source field, which is mandatory, and a target field, which is uh, mandatory as well. Then uh, can have a label, so the type of uh, the relationship, and the data attached to the edge. Then we have a labels field, which is a map key value, where the key is the label of the node, and the value is the color that we want to give to that node. The, then we have the directed uh, field, which can be uh, true or false, and tell, tells us if uh, the graph is uh, directed or not. And in the end, we have the field uh, types, which is a distinct list of uh, edge types. Here you can find a simple uh, JavaScript uh, function that allows you to generate a random complex uh, graph. But, uh, Let's see the display system in action. So the display system must be activated with the percentage network prefix. And as I said before, is a JSON. So our graph here have uh, uh, three nodes. The first one is uh, uh, the type of user and uh, has uh, data with a property full name and value uh, under Santurbano. In the same way, the second node is a user node with uh, a property full name and a uh, name uh, Limonsu, which is the creator of uh, Apache Zeppelin. And the third node is a project node, and we have a property name, which, uh, value is, uh, which the value is uh, Zeppelin. And then we have the edges. The first one that starts from node two and ends in uh, node one we, with label helps. The second one, which starts from the node two and ends in node three with label create. And the last one, just let me highlight, which starts from the node one and uh, ends in node three with uh, label uh, contribute to and uh, 
uh, here we have a data attached to the edge. In uh, this case, uh, the name of the property is old PR, and the value is the link to the, uh, the first PR, uh, my first PR on uh, Zeppelin. Then we have the labels field with a user, uh, with a color, and the same thing from project. It's a directed graph, and uh, list uh, the uh, and the set of uh, types are helps create and contribute to. So if I run our paragraph, here we have uh, our first network. As we can see here in the top left, we have some statistics about uh, our graph. So our graph is composed by three nodes. The nodes in green are users. The node uh, in uh, blue uh, are projects. Our graph has three, uh, have three uh, 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 relationship, helps create and contribute to. You can zoom in and zoom out the graph. If you uh, get a precise value of uh, scale in your zoom, uh, the display system shows all the labels related to the graph. If we click on a node, here in the bottom left, we see all the property attached to the node. Each graph uh, can be uh, configured by clicking here in the settings. So uh, we can configure the force layout settings because uh, the network display system used the uh, force layout. And we have uh, some other parameters, uh, such as the minimum scale to show node and edge labels. If I put this value to one, there will be show once the, render, the, the rendering is over. We can choose the labels to show uh, on our graph. So for user, I want to show a full name property. And for a project, I want to show uh, the name property. Then we can close. And uh, once the render uh, is over, Zeppelin uh, will show all the labels attached to the node. OK. Now we have the second demo. Uh, uh, if you go ahead, uh, I prepared uh, some other graph in order, in order to test uh, the display system. For instance, this one is uh, an, uh, an undirected uh, graph. Uh, sorry, one thing that I forgot is, uh, as I said before, uh, the network display system is built in order to extend the table display system. So the graph will be flattened. This means that we have a table representation of our graph, as you can see here. And we can leverage the other uh, uh, widget provided by Zeppelin, OK, in the same way. So let's go to the second demo. The second demo is about how to build a simple data pipeline with uh, Zeppelin Spark uh, and Neo4j. Here we see how we can use the Neo4j interpreter. So as I said uh, in the slides, uh, with the percentage Neo4j keyword, we activate the uh, Neo4j interpreter, and then we can write uh, our Cypher queries directly on Zeppelin. This is a query that uh, cleans the database. It's useful if you want to run the notebook uh, multiple times. So please don't do it in production. In this paragraph, we uh, basically download uh, a CSV file uh, from the Socrata API of the, uh, of, uh, the uh, uh, city of Chicago. And we save it into the file system. This is Scala code. Uh, as we can see, the Zeppelin allows to mix uh, Cypher and Scala code easily. 
Here we are using the uh, Sparks API in order to load that CSV into a data frame. In this paragraph, we are uh, printing the schema of the data frame, so we can see the, there is uh, 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 the ID column, for instance, uh, latitude, uh, longitude, the primary type of the crime, uh, uh, and so on. So, starting uh, from uh, this schema, we want to construct a graph model just like this. So we have four nodes, bit, the police district, with a bit property, crime, with uh, ID, description, case number, and point properties, crime type, with primary type uh, property, and crime date with parsed date property. This graph, this graph also have three relationships. On bit, that starts from a bit and ends in a crime. Is type, that starts from a crime and ends in a crime type. And on date, that starts from a crime and ends in a crime date. So here we are, we are doing some uh, ETL stuff, very simply ETL stuff. We are uh, computing two, we are adding two uh, more columns to our data frame. The first one was, uh, is parsed date. So we basically uh, truncate the date uh, uh, to the day. And the second one is the column point which uh, is a concatenation of uh, latitude and longitude. This because uh, uh, the Neo4j Spark connector uh, at this time uh, don't support the uh, spatial and uh, date properties of Neo4j 3.4. So this is because I add these two columns. So here we are leveraging the, the Zeppelin API in order to display the, the, our data frame, our extended data frame. For instance, we have the, here the tabular representation. Here we have the bar chart representation. Now we are defining some constraints uh, on Neo4j in order to speed up the import process. So for instance, I create uh, a bit property on the bit uh, label, asserting that it is unique. In the same way, uh, I assert that uh, on a crime node, the, the ID property is unique. Again, the primary type is unique for the crime type. And the parsed date is unique for the crime date. So this is the, our ATL job. Uh, here we have uh, four values. These values are related to our four nodes. This, uh, this is a Scala code, and uh, each value is a tuple. The first uh, property of uh, the tuple is the label of the node. The second property of the the tuple uh, is the sequence of property we want to put into our node. The first property is used by the Neo4j Spark connector in order to merge the data into Neo4j. So for instance, here for the bit node, we use the bit property to merge the data. In the same way, for the crime, we have four properties, and the first one, the ID, is the property where we merge the data, our data. Same way for the crime type. The primary type is uh, the, our uh, merged property. And uh, the same thing from the crime date. These three values are for the relationship. So we have, uh, this is also a tuple. We have the on bit relationship, and this time the sequence of properties are simply empty. 
Then we leverage the uh, Neo4j data frame uh, Scala object and uh, in particular the merge edge list uh, method in order to import our data frame uh, into Neo4j. This method uh, talks five parameters. The first one is uh, the Spark context. The second one is the data frame. The third one is the source node. The fourth is the relationship. And the last one, uh, the, the, source, uh, the source node relationship, and the last one is the target node. So once we have executed this paragraph, all the data is imported into Neo4j, and then we can uh, simply run uh, some queries uh, over uh, Neo4j. This one uh, runs a simple count, okay, which uh, returns uh, only a tabular result. As you can see, here we don't have the network icon. Here, we can write uh, our cipher query. For instance, we are asking, uh, all crimes uh, and all crime date uh, with uh, the crime type nodes, and uh, we are limit the results by 10, and we have uh, uh, that this is the result graph. We have uh, 18 nodes uh, and uh, 20 relationships, and uh, the node in, uh, in green is bit, which is missing because in our cipher query we don't ask it for the bit node. Uh, the, in the light blue we have the crime, uh, in blue we have the crime type, and in orange we have the crime date. So in the same way I can click on a node and see all the properties, in this case uh, the parsed date property. We can zoom in and zoom out. Okay. We can switch between uh, representations. We have the bar chart here, for instance. Moreover, the uh, Neo4j interpreter can leverage uh, the Zeppelin dynamic forms in order to build parameterized query. So you can write your cipher query, and you can parameterize it by using this uh, keyword. So we can use the dollar. And uh, Zeppelin basically renders an uh, input uh, an input area, which can be uh, when uh, we can uh, put our data. And the same way, we uh, focus our cipher query over uh, the primary type of crime type, which is uh, weapons violation. So we have just one node with weapons violation and all the crimes uh, related uh, to uh, that crime type and the crime date. One important thing that uh, uh, is the, uh, again, the uh, network display systems uh, extend the table display system. So if, uh, for instance, uh, you have previously downloaded uh, some Helium uh, modu module, for instance, I, uh, for instance, I downloaded uh, the leaflet module that allows to have a, a map representation of our data. You can easily switch on that module, and here we have the uh, point of interest of each crime. Here we have the settings. I use the point that we built in our uh, ATL uh, paragraph. And uh, in the description, I put uh, the, the description in uh, the tooltip, I put the description of the crime. Okay. So let's go back to the slides. Okay, the uh, last thing uh, that we see today is uh, our uh, CAPS cipher for Apache Spark can be integrated uh, with Apache Zeppelin. 
How many of you already know uh, what is uh, Cypher for Apache Spark? Okay. So uh, it's uh, a very nice project, uh, in my opinion, that uh, extends uh, Spark, allowing to uh, uh, create and query property graph all over Spark. It's, uh, uh, it has uh, three main features. So it's built on top of uh, Spark's Data Frames API. So it can leverage uh, some cool features of Spark, such as the Catalyst Optimizer uh, and uh, uh, every uh, CAPS data structure representation can always access to the uh, respective data frame representation. So you can go back and forward switching to a CAPS data structure and to a data frame structure and vice versa. It supports a subset of Cypher. In particular, supports a very uh, nice feature with, which is called uh, Multigraph that allows you to define uh, starting from the same uh, data source uh, multigraphs. So you can, uh, uh, you can build uh, uh, um, a lot of graphs starting of the, the same data source. And supports a, a, wide, a wide range of data sources. It's built uh, uh, in order with, a, it's built with a, a, an API that allows uh, the developer to easily ingest graphs and is easy ball uh, extendable. So let's see the last uh, demo of today. So again, please make sure that you have previously executed uh, the, not the notebook that loads all the required uh, dependencies. So in the first notebook, uh, we are loading uh, all the required uh, libraries. Here we are creating a social network data frame with uh, uh, three nodes of a person. Uh, the first one is Alice, the second one is Bob, uh, the third one is Eve. Uh, the structure of our data frame is uh, composed by uh, three fields, the ID, the name, and the age. In the same way, the else node return uh, data frames of uh, the relationship. So we have two relationships, one that starts from the node with ID uh, zero and then uh, in the ID one with uh, a property since. And then one, uh, the last one that start from uh, node one and then node two. In this paragraph, we uh, initiate our Spark session, our uh, CAP session. Uh, the CAP session is uh, like uh, the Spark session, so is the the starting entry point of uh, all uh, CAPS APIs. If we use uh, this method, local, we initiated a local CAPS session. So we use a local Spark session and uh, CAPS that wraps the Spark session runs in local mode. If you have uh, an already running uh, Spark uh, uh, cluster, you can leverage that Spark session by using the method create. In this paragraph, uh, we are basically uh, executing uh, our uh, social network uh, data frame object. So we are uh, uh, computing our data frames. In this one, we are putting uh, the previous data frames into CAPS structure. So CAPS has two structure. CAPS node table, which is the representation for uh, our nodes, and CAPS relationship table, which is the representation uh, for the relationship. Starting from the CAPS uh, session with the read from method, 
we inject uh, the two uh, previously uh, data structure, so the person table and the friends table, and we have our property graph that runs into Spark. With uh, this paragraph, we are basically uh, run a cipher query, a simple cipher query over Spark, and we are collect the results and print it uh, in the, into the notebook. One cool feature of uh, CAPS is that uh, it can directly uh, uh, display uh, property graphs that runs in memory on Spark directly on Zeppelin. If you use starting from our property graph that we have uh, previously instantiated, the print graph method, we can run this method and Zeppelin renders the graph directly into the notebook. At the same way, we can uh, uh, configure our network. So for instance, here we use the, the property name for the person. In the same way, the graph is resetable. So these are our, uh, our caps uh, leverage uh, uh, Zeppelin in order to display graphs uh, directly on it. So I think uh, this is the end. This is the link uh, of uh, the repository. So please uh, open an issue if you, if you have uh, some, uh, some trouble with the code, if you need uh, some help. Uh, the slides will be on the, uh, the Graph uh, Connect website, so we can download it. Uh. Is that the integration? Yeah, 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 yeah. It's, uh, you can uh, also run this, uh, this Docker Compose uh, command, and you are up and running. So, thanks to everyone. And uh, I don't know if we are in time, but if uh, someone has uh, questions. Uh, no questions? Sure? Great. So. I hope to see you on GitHub. Thank you.